Our next speaker is Jan Werner, who is the Director General of the European Space Agency. Unfortunately, Jan got pulled away with a late-breaking schedule conflict involving one of the ESA member states, but he was gracious enough to actually put together a video presentation that uh, we, will, we will show momentarily. Uh, Jan has been uh, the ESA Director General uh, since July 2015. Uh, he's a former head of the German delegation to ESA and served as a chairman of the ESA Council from 2012 to 2014. He also serves as the chairman of the executive board of the German Aerospace Center, DLR. He was president of the Technical University Darmstadt from 1995 to 2007 and had also served there as dean of the newly established civil engineering faculty uh, and prior to that, a professor of civil engineering. He's a recipient of numerous prizes uh, and positions. He has honorary doctorates from New York State University at Buffalo, Technical Universities of Bucharest and Mongolia, St. Petersburg University for Economics and Finance in Russia, and Ecole Centrale de Lyon in France. Among his many awards, he has been awarded the honors of Knight of the French Legion d'Honneur. Um, let's uh, tee up the video. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, I cannot be with you today because I have to be with one of my member states, and member states are the most important thing for ESA. 50th anniversary is something you have to celebrate. We are all celebrating, of course, 50th anniversary of the first man on the moon. But it's also very nice to celebrate 50 years of space research at universities. Instead of being with you, I have, be, uh, I have a recorded message for you. So thank you very much for accepting that. So let's have a look back first. Space 1.0, this was astronomy. It was the first step of humans to go beyond the Earth. Space 2.0, this was the race in space in the 50s and 60s of the last century with a well-known result of the first American on the surface of the moon. At that time also, there were some experiments with animals. Uh, Laika, the Russian dog, or Ham, the American monkey. But there was also an experiment with a European animal. And this was Felicet. Felicet was also through a launcher brought into space. She was not orbiting the Earth, but uh, just a suborbital flight. And it is a nice story because uh, originally it was planned to have Felix, a male cat, in uh, space. But unfortunately, on the day of the launch, Felix disappeared. So a strong female cat has to take his position. 1968, each and every one remembers this picture if he lived already at that time. The very nice picture of the Earth looking from the moon. At that time, a few months before, another thing was orbiting um, the moon. It were turtles, two turtles launched from the Soviets. So this was really the race in Spain. And Germany, Germany and Europe were looking just in two videos to make something. So this was a movie from 1966. Interesting enough, the spacecraft was made, it was called Orion. And you see, it was an international staff. So the commander Cliff Alistair McLean from the US officer, Mario de Monti from Italy, then Japan, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Sweden, France, and for me as a young boy, very interesting, the security officer Samara Yagolovsk from Russia, not from the Soviet Union. So it was really looking into the future. And of course, we all remember also 1975 Soyuz Apollo mission, the first international cooperation um, between these two nations in space. Another thing which happened in 1978 was a very clever uh, way forward uh, done by the Soviets, and that was the so-called Intercosmos program, where uh, Russia invited member states of the uh, overall cooperation in the eastern part um, to, uh, to take part. So in this very special case, it was a German uh, cosmonaut, an East German cosmonaut, Sigmund Yen, who could fly with the Russians into space. 
1985, the mission D1 um, with uh, also three uh, European astronauts, Messerschmitt, Ockel, and Fuhr. And this was a step forward for more cooperation between the United States of America and Europe. 1995, Mir and Space Shuttle Atlantis, another very important point of cooperation between Russia and the United States of America. And today we have Space 3.0 and the International Space Station is a clear indication for international cooperation and steps for more global cooperation, but also for new space applications in various fields, Earth observation, navigation, telecommunication. So space today is an infrastructure already. And therefore we are using this infrastructure to tackle global challenges like climate change, migration, mobility, communication, energy, shortage of resources, demographic developments, conflicts and catastrophes, health, but also, and this is very important for me, curiosity, because curiosity is the strongest driver of humankind. And in space, we can also handle all of these different aspects through information, innovation, interaction, and coming back to the curiosity, also inspiration of people. Competition is for sure a driver. Who would run so fast uh, if you could use a car? But the competition in sports is a driver to be faster and faster. At the same time, cooperation is an enabler because through cooperation we can achieve things the single nation could not achieve. Now we are in a shift of paradigms. I call it Space 4.0. This is including, of course, also new space, Internet of Things, digitalization, and artificial intelligence. And it is based on the situation that we have totally different motivations than 50 years ago. We have more and more actors worldwide, not only the public actors, not only two big space agencies. We have more than 70 spacefaring nations. We have universities, industry launching their own missions. So it's really a total change of the world. For us in Europe, it's also that we have not only the European Space Agency, but we have national, national space agencies, and we have also the European Union now uh, going into space. So the, it, this is a big change, and I think we all have to see how we can really, uh, in this new world, define our roles. ESA is doing, of course, science and exploration, so we have a big number of scientific missions. We are very happy that together with the United States of America, we are part of the James Webb Space Telescope, which hopefully will be launched in 2021. We are looking forward for gravitational waves with Lisa and uh, Athena, which should observe at the same time dark uh, matter and black holes. We are looking to dark universe with Euclid. We are on the way to Mercury with Bepi Colombo, and we are planning also a solar orbiter which should be launched uh, next year, and this year still we are looking forward to launch uh, Cheops, which should look to exoplanet. Europe light, uh, landed on Titan. And this landing was, of course, due to the cooperation with the United States of America, who brought us to Titan, um, Cassini-Huygens mission, and uh, our tiny lander then, uh, the first time uh, that the uh, lander was really going to Titan and landing on, the, on this very strange world over there. There's always a question, where does the water come from on Earth? We know that two-thirds of the surface of the Earth is covered by water, but where is the water from? And there are several theories, and one theory is it should come from comets. Comets are frozen material, and therefore it is very clear that Comets could be the source of the water on the surface of the Earth. The Earth was in its history so hot that there was no water at all on the surface, so therefore we have to find where does it come from. And because it was the idea that water comes from the uh, comets, Europe was planning the mission Rosetta. And uh, Rosetta was a mission which went to comet of garcia Mango. so we had two spacecrafts. One was the spacecraft of the European Space Agency, and the other one, Philly, a small lander, which then touched down on this tiny comet. 
It was a very successful mission um, and it was interesting because at the same time while we are doing the research and while we found out that the water of, of this comet is not exactly the same as on Earth because the uh, distribution of heavy water and um, light water is not the same as uh, on Earth. But at the same time we were also developing something very special. That was a camera on board of Rosetta which uh, should, uh, should take images of the comet. Comets are very, very dark, really dark like charcoal. So this camera was able to make differences between different shades of grey. And because of that, the company which developed this uh, special camera thought, OK, why not use it on Earth again? And there it is. It is now used for early forest fire detection because it overlooks uh, uh, forest and if something grey comes out of the forest, the camera can immediately identify whether it's uh, smoke or whether it's just uh, water vapor. As I mentioned earlier, Beppe Colombo is on its way to Mercury. It's a seven year trip with electric propulsion in a very special world because uh, Mercury is very hot at the, on the side uh, oriented towards the sun and it's very cold on the other side. So we have three spacecraft at once. One is a propulsion unit, one is a part of the Japanese uh, space agency JAXA and one is the one of uh, ESA. Shortly after our launch, we could have some first images from space and could show that uh, really the solar panels are in best condition. By the way, the solar panels have a size like an aircraft, so it's really huge, this uh, satellite, this spacecraft, which is now um, going towards, uh, it, uh, towards uh, Mercury. ExoMars. This is a little bit of a sorry story because originally we planned to have this mission to look for life on the surface of Mars together with the Americans. Unfortunately, the um, United States of America decided not to go with us, so we had to find another partner for the main part of this mission. And Russia is now providing the launcher, so, but still NASA is with us on board. We have two missions in this uh, very special project. Uh, one is uh, uh, Trace Gas Orbiter on the left hand side of this picture, which is measuring the methane atmosphere of uh, Mars. And uh, the other one is on the right hand side, a rover which we will launch next year. And uh, this uh, uh, rover should uh, drill into the surface of uh, Mars in order to look whether there is some life. When we planned the 2016 mission, we thought, okay, if we are on the way to Mars, then we can also try to have already a landing. So we had a small lander called Schiaparelli, which was just a demonstrator. And you all know how difficult it is to land on the surface of Mars. So first you have to withstand the re-entry into the atmosphere, then you can have a parachute, you should separate the heat shield, you should separate also the parachute, and then you need some engines to really have a soft touchdown. More or less everything went very well, however, 3.7 kilometers above the surface uh, of Mars, uh, the engines were stopped and we had a touchdown, but a rather hard touchdown. So it was not so nice for us. And this was a reaction in the press. ExoMars, Schiaparelli Mars probe crashed, making it two failed landing attempts from either. This was newspaper in Europe. Now, we all know Elon Musk, and Elon Musk uh, successfully is uh, recovering in the first stages of uh, his launchers. Um, and when he tried that for the first times, uh, he was not successful. So you see here his uh, third trial, he is trying to land on the surface of the small ship. And unfortunately, this was not a successful trial, as you can see in a second. So it was similar to our case because um, the satellite was in orbit, as our trace gas orbiter is in orbit around Mars, but he wanted to demonstrate, to test a landing on the surface of the Earth as we tried to land Schiaparelli on the surface of Mars, both failed. Now let's have a look also to the press in this case. So um, the press in uh, Europe said, SpaceX failed again with landing trial launcher absorbs crash landing. But here you see the difference to the United States of America because over there it was said, 
SpaceX release deck camera footage of Falcon 09 almost landing. So it's a much better tone. And Elon Musk sent it to Full RUD, rapid unscheduled disassembly event. Chip is fine, minor repairs, exciting day. Can you imagine what happened if I would say similar words after the crash of Scaparelli? Full, rapid, unscheduled disassembly event. Mars is fine, no re repairs, exciting day. I would be fine. 2014, the Crimea conflict started. And at that time, I was invited to witness the launch of some uh, astronauts. And I can tell you I was really I was really afraid whether it will take place or not because of this uh, conflict uh, in Ukraine. But then I could see these three astronauts, Alexander Gerst from Europe, Maxim Suraya from Russia, and Reid Weisman from the United States of America. And it was really good for me to see that it was possible to really bridge earthly crisis with uh, uh, And of course, they went to the International Space Stations they showed uh, that we can do a lot of research uh, disciplines on the International Space Station, especially also human physiology, biotechnology, but also material science. But as, as they are humans, uh, Alexander Gerst also reported very often about what he could see from space. He could see the beauty and he could see also some difficult situations. I think this is the human perspective of exploration, and therefore it's important. And I show you another picture. This is Samantha Cristoforetti, um, a European astronaut with an Italian passport. You see on the left hand side, you see the Earth with a very thin atmosphere. You see the moon, and on the right hand side, you see her face after her landing saying, I'm so happy that I'm back on this marvelous planet. So it's, it's a clear message for us take care of the planet Earth. Where to go in the future? That's one of the big questions. Is Mars the next destination? Or where do we go? Go to Mars, it's really a challenge because it takes the way there and back, it takes about two years, while you can go to within one week to the moon and back. And if you go to Mars, you have not only the question of how to withstand two years, but also psychology, radiation uh, and uh, propulsion is uh, a special challenge uh, in order to come back from Mars. <laughs> Therefore, I believe that it's re really the Moon, our next uh, destination. It can be done on an international scheme, it can be done human and robotic, public and private. We can test a lot of things over there, we can learn how to uh, really use the uh, resources in situ, so it's a stepping stone also to go further. And I call it Moon Village. And this one was, uh, when we discussed the first time about it, several people were rather surprised about this uh, idea and were not clear what we want to do. Uh, of course, there are a lot of ideas, for instance, on the far side of the moon to have a radio observatory to look deep into space without all the um, disturbance which we have on Earth. Um, there is a company already providing now some idea of how to do the communication from Earth to the surface of the Moon. There, is, there are uh, companies, and in this uh, picture you see NASA providing also what to do with uh, the resources we have over there, so 3D printing in this case for roads, and I hope not with the speed limits uh, of the United States of America, but anyhow it shows that we can work together on the surface of and therefore, the Lunar Gateway is now the very logical next step. It's a bus stop to go to the surface of the Moon, and we Europeans are very eager to take part in this new way forward. I'm happy that also the ones who first said, let's go to Mars, are now with us, uh, saying, yes, the Moon is the first important step, for instance, Elon Musk, but also Jeff Bezos, uh, and of course, um, we Europeans are thinking about a moon village. The Americans are thinking at the same time about the city on the moon. Um, this is, uh, for me, okay. The most important thing is, let's do it. A Scandinavian company uh, offered uh, some housing. Uh, maybe it's a little bit uh, different to what we think. But anyhow, it shows that the idea to go to the moon 
is a global way. And therefore, my clear message is, yes, this was a very nice experience. It was past which we should value, but at the same time, we should prepare for the future. And the Moon Village can be a very important step in this direction. And we should do it not nationally or bilaterally, we should do it globally, cooperation across the whole globe. And this is a message which I also got from Mahatma Gandhi. Our ability to reach unity and diversity will be the beauty and the test of our civilization. Thank you very much that you paid, my, paid me attention. And again, apologies that I could not be with you today. I uh, wish that I could report that Jan also recorded answers to your questions, but uh, that was not possible. So we are scheduled for a coffee break, and we shall reconvene at 3.15 p.m. promptly. Thanks.